Not only did we get a mailbag crammed full of questions about the age of the Earth, our two lead stories are also on that subject, giving an age to Grand Canyon and Pat Robertson doesn't understand the biblical view of the age of the Earth, nor dinosaurs, which we expound upon in a new rant. This is Genesis Week. And a welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the origins controversy made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education, and now carried on the Christianima Network, Christianima.com, Christian Cinema at its finest, bringing you the best in pirate broadcasting. We took over the old abandoned Camp Century, where we continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and giving glory to our creator while doing it. We believe God gave you an intelligently designed brain because he wants you to use it. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com or genesisweek.com and you can find us. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo Rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Flowers and Farley published a paper in Science Magazine attempting to date Grand Canyon using the helium-4, helium-3 thermochronometry and concluding that Grand Canyon was cut some 70 million years ago. Uh, this is in stark contrast to the current thinking of those who embrace deep time, who would claim Grand Canyon was carved maybe five or six million years ago. Now, obviously, myself and many, many others don't agree with any of those ages, because we would attest that the evidence shows it's all quite young and can only be adequately explained within the context of a worldwide flood. In fact, Flowers and Farley even acknowledged the problems of interpreting Grand Canyon within deep time right in the abstract of their paper. Grand Canyon is one of the most dramatic features on Earth, yet when and why it was carved have been controversial for more than 150 years. Notice not just when it was carved, but the why and how remain unresolved. Now, the reasons for this are obvious, though you'll never hear about this by just visiting Grand Canyon. If you go to the park, you are told over and over again that the mighty Colorado River carved this massive canyon. Okay, first of all, the river ain't that mighty, <laughs> especially when you compare the scale of the river to the canyon. No, we would contend that rather than the river causing the canyon, the canyon caused the river. The Grand Canyon cuts through the Colorado uplift, which is a giant dome uplift. Well, picture a dome the water can go around the dome. But in this case, the water went right through the dome. The Colorado River would have to climb uphill some 3,000 feet in order to begin cutting the canyon. Millions of years does not fix this little problem because millions of years does not change the laws of gravity. However, within the context of a global flood, the receding flood waters of Noah's flood were already above the mountains so water will cut whatever is in its road. Now notice what Flowers said about the history of Grand Canyon. If history were as simple as the popular view, the canyon's origins wouldn't continue to be a topic of hot debate. Here at Genesis Week, we hear it said all the time that the majority of scientists believe evolution, as if that means it must be true. Uh, this is a logical fallacy called argumentum ad populum, and there are numerous problems with this thinking. For instance, ask any scientist and he will tell you his conclusions are tentative. They can be proven wrong at any moment. The majority of scientists believe evolution because they are told that the majority of scientists believe evolution. The majority also believes that Christopher Columbus sailed to the New World to prove that the Earth was round and not flat, because everyone in his day believed the Earth was flat. Well, this is a patently false statement. Everyone in Columbus's day knew the Earth was a sphere. And in fact, this flat Earth myth was started by two anti-theists who were trying to attribute this ridiculous belief to Christians and creationists in order to make them look bad. Now, this is a historical point, 
and the majority believes it. But that does not make a truth. So Flower's comment is quite appropriate for the subject at hand. If so many can be so wrong about historical truths, many scientists believing in deep time is utterly meaningless because deep time is not testable, repeatable, or verifiable. No one was there to record the events. On that note, it's interesting that several researchers are disagreeing with the conclusions of Flowers and Farley and presenting what appears to be good reasons to doubt. Now, David Coppage once again gives an excellent analysis of the whole age wars, as he calls it. David's whole point was that we obviously can't trust the deep time continually handed to us, especially when they disagree with each other by so much. The dates suggested range range from 5 to 70 million years. Uh, different by a factor of 14. So how do you know which age is right? Especially when those same people would also claim that the Red Wall and Muav limestones in Grand, Wall, in Grand Canyon were laid down over millions of years. But they're interbedded. They're interfingered with each other. Now, in order to lay them down in interfingered layers, they had to have been laid down at the same time, not millions of years apart. The fire engine red hermit shale has cracks in it that have been filled in with the prominent bright white Coconino sandstone. Now the sandstone was supposedly laid down millions of years after the hermit shale. Wait a minute. In the space of one year, you would fill those cracks in the hermit shale with debris and other sediments. Instead, they're filled with pure Coconino sandstone, indicating the two layers were laid down, geologically speaking, at the same time. Now you can see these cracks for yourself as you hike down the Bright Angel Trail. Now there's much more I could point out, but we need to move along in this program. Suffice it to say, there is every reason to question the claims of deep time put forward by those who believe in an old earth and every reason to believe it was all laid down rapidly in a worldwide flood. The 700 Club's Pat Robertson was answering a question from a viewer named Michelle who was concerned because her teenage boys were questioning the Bible. Now, as you all know, I am all for questioning the Bible. In fact, the Bible itself tells us to test all things. What things? All things. Well, all would seem to include the Bible, would it not? I'm not afraid of asking the tough questions, including questions like, is the Bible the Word of God? What about the Quran? Is it the inspired word of God? What about the Book of Mormon? You see, anybody can claim to have a book given to them by God. So how would you know if the book is or is not from God unless you ask questions about it, unless you test it? Truth demands scrutiny while error begs for tolerance. Unfortunately, Robertson apparently did not think through the consequences of his response when he said, and you go back in time, you've got radiocarbon dating, you've got all these things, and you've got the, 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 the carcasses of dinosaurs frozen in time. They're out there. And so there was a time that these giant reptiles were on the earth, and it was before the time of the Bible. So don't try to cover it up and make like everything was 6,000 years. But that's not the Bible. Well, actually, it is there. Where on earth do you think Usher got his numbers from? Numerous other researchers have also come to similar conclusions. Here's Brock Lee's analysis. The reasoning is pretty simple. We have the genealogies from Christ right through to Adam and Eve, who Jesus himself said were created in the beginning. Now, furthermore, Mr. Robertson, apparently you are giving more authority to people, namely scientists, than God and his word. Further to that, you chose to give the scientists more authority than Usher. If you're giving people more authority than God, why reject Usher's research and embrace atheistic scientists? I am bewildered by your comments. Now, apparently Robertson never clued into the fact that he just put millions of dead dinosaurs before the entrance of sin into the world. As we read in the Bible, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So Mr. Robertson, was there death before Adam or not? Is the Bible true or not? Jesus was supposed to bear the consequences of our sins, which is why he died on the cross. It was a consequence of sin. You have just nullified the reason for Christ's death on the cross. 
Now, there are huge theological problems with what Robertson said, which, while he shouldn't have ventured into scientific matters he knows nothing about, he certainly should have realized the theological consequences of what he was saying. Now, apparently, Robertson is not aware of the testimony of Charles Templeton, a friend and former evangelist with Billy Graham. Templeton believed what the evolutionists told him. Templeton did not know the information I share with you on this program. So while Templeton had the wrong information, he did make a correct deduction. He correctly concluded that if we evolved, and the Earth was billions of years old, then Jesus was either mistaken or a liar, because Jesus believed the Genesis account of creation. He spoke of Genesis account as literal history. Now, if Jesus was either mistaken or liar, then that means he was not the Son of God. As a consequence, Charles Templeton wound up rejecting the Christian faith, became an outspoken atheist, and penned his book, Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. So, Mr. Robertson, this is not so much about lynching you as it is calling your attention to the very real dangers of what you said. You, you talked about carbon-14 and dinosaurs in one sentence as if they both somehow proved a time much, much older than 6,000 years old. Mr. Robertson, apparently you haven't watched this show where we've talked about carbon-14 in dinosaur bones extensively. If those dinosaur bones are millions of years old, there should be no carbon-14 in them. Instead, carbon-14 actually shows that the Earth is only a few thousand years old, not billions. Lastly, Mr. Robertson obviously has never been to a dinosaur excavation or seen an actual dinosaur in place because then he would know that dinosaurs provide powerful evidence of the flood of Noah. Let's review the matter. In Crivo Rant, number 17, what happened to the dinosaurs? We're always presented with the mystery question. What was it that killed the dinosaurs? Now, I've excavated dinosaurs in multiple locations across North America, also dinosaur tracks. You don't have to excavate very long to find the answer to this question. Let's take a look at the evidence. Now, when we find dinosaurs and dinosaur bones, we usually find different kinds of dinosaurs that have been ripped apart and buried together. Now, what on earth would rip dinosaurs apart and bury them together?
Out here in the badlands of Alberta, the evidence speaks loudly and clearly. We find dinosaur bones buried with fossil clams, which have been buried alive in the closed position. Now we know by research that clams can burrow out of surprisingly deep sediments when they are rapidly buried. Obviously, this was a catastrophic event involving water. We also find dinosaurs buried with their heads pulled back in the death pose, evidence of asphyxiation and rapid burial. Well, asphyxiation and rapid burial would certainly line up with a flood. In fact, if you tour dinosaur museums, you'll notice they acknowledge this fact. Over and over again, as you tour throughout these museums and read their interpretive plaques, you'll notice they say, this dinosaur drowned in a flood. This herd of dinosaurs drowned trying to cross a raging river. This dinosaur drowned in a lake. Occasionally, you'll see an outdated plaque that claims that the dinosaurs pulled their heads back because they laid out in the desert, and the desert heat dried the tendons in the back of the neck, thus pulling the head back. Wait a minute. We find clams buried with the dinosaurs. Last I checked, you don't find a lot of clams out in the desert, especially not clams being buried alive in the desert. After seeing the overwhelming evidence that it was a flood that killed the dinosaurs, we are then fed the line that it was actually an asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. In fact, we're even told where the crater from this asteroid was. It's supposedly on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. It's known as the Chicxulub Crater. The layer at which these dinosaurs allegedly vanish is known as the KT boundary. K for Cretaceous, T for Tertiary. It's marked with a rare mineral called iridium. Now, of course, iridium is found in asteroids, so it is alleged that this iridium came from the asteroid that impacted Earth and killed the dinosaurs. Problem number one. There's iridium found in layers both above and below the KT boundary. So, were those also asteroid impacts? If they were, why did or did they not kill off the dinosaurs then? Problem number two. Iridium is also emitted in vast quantities by volcanoes. Therefore, iridium does not necessarily mean it was an asteroid impact. Problem number three. An Alberta research team concluded that some of the dinosaurs survived the KT extinction by an evolutionary time scale of 700,000 years. Wait a minute. If they survived for 700,000 years after the impact, do you really think that an asteroid impact had anything to do with the demise of the dinosaurs? Problem number four. Four, evolutionary researchers redated the Chicxulub impact as 300,000 years prior to the KT event. That's a million years before the last dinosaurs became extinct, according to the evolutionary timescale. Having personally examined and excavated dinosaurs in multiple locations, I can personally attest to the evidence that states loudly the dinosaurs were buried in a massive flood. In fact, for multiple reasons, I would say it was a worldwide flood. The Morrison Formation, for example, which I have excavated in, covers 10 states and three Canadian provinces. This was no meandering river. This was a giant, watery catastrophe. Well, the Bible talks about a worldwide flood. It was judgment sent from God against an exceedingly wicked people. But even in that judgment, God was merciful. He sent his servant Noah to warn the people and spent 100 years of his life building a giant ship called the Ark of Noah. He warned the people of the judgment to come. All they had to do was believe and obey and get on the Ark. That's all they had to do. It was free salvation provided by God for the people so that they could escape his judgment. All they had to do was repent and believe. So what about all those people who didn't get on the ark and they died in the flood? Well, whose fault was that? For 100 years, they were warned of judgment to come. The Bible tells us that God was eventually the one who closed the door on the ark. Now that ark is symbolic of the Lord Jesus Christ, who warned us of a judgment to come and that he was the salvation from that judgment to come. One day, Christ will return, the door to that salvation will be closed. Which side of the door will you be on? Why don't you call upon Jesus today, ask him to forgive you for your sins, and believe on him and be saved from the judgment to come. 
So I present this information in hopes of enlightening both Mr. Robertson and his viewers that it's perfectly reasonable to accept that the fossil dinosaurs, rather than refuting the Bible, are actually best explained by the history written in the Bible and a young Earth, and not deep time. Woohoo! Mail for me! The Age of the Earth show obviously struck a nerve, as it prompted an avalanche of feedback. Ian, you have a great knack for putting something seemingly complicated into an easy to understand format using plain logic and common sense. Another great video. My goodness, Ian, if I ever saw evolution being pwned, this is it. Pwnage at its best. The only thing that someone can say from here and on defending evolution is, you are simply a conspiracy theorist. As much as I like the presenter, this is the most misguided false scientific video I've ever watched. Why would dinosaurs living with men prevent the Earth from being older than 6,000 years? Excellent question. In short, according to evolution, dinosaurs were supposed to have gone extinct at least 60 million years before humans ever evolved. Yet in the Bible, God created the sea and land creatures, such as the dinosaurs, on days 5 and 6 of creation week, with humans on day 6. Thus, if we find evidence of humans and dinosaurs living together, it affirms the biblical account of creation and refutes evolution and deep time. One of my favorite YouTube atheists commented on the erosion rates argument. Your statements on erosion miss a myriad of points, including plate tectonics, new earth being formed, dynamic erosion speeds, etc. And also YouTuber Fact This took issue with the erosion rates, and we had a brief exchange where he provided further detailed argument. Now I have to edit it for brevity, but you can read his comments in their entirety on YouTube. You ignore that A, erosion rates are not uniform spatially and temporally, B, tectonic forces raise the crust acting as relief, furthermore we can still measure mountains rising today, C, all mountains did not form at the same time, and D, mass is recycled and crust is often replenished. Your calculation was far too basic and ignored nearly all key geomorphological and tectonic principles. On fossils and erosion, I'll remind you that erosion rates are not uniform worldwide. You can't take a blanket rate and apply it everywhere. In sedimentary basins, for example, there is very little occurring. Many fossils across the globe have indeed been eroded, but those in areas that haven't seen much erosion, or have yet to be reached, have not. Cycling of rock mass occurs where the mass is mobile i.g. where it's being eroded or corroded and deposited accreted. Volumes of mass undergoing little to no erosion are essentially static and aren't being cycled. In summary, we don't see flattened continents because of spatial and temporal erosion, inconformity and tectonic activity. This is all well known. I'd suggest thorough background reading before making your next video. Well, let's break this down for a moment, starting with B, tectonic forces raise the crust, acting as relief. Furthermore, we can still measure mountains rising today. All the mountains did not form at the same time. Well, actually, your argument then is with geomorphology experts Olye and Payne, not I, because they were the ones who provided 20 reasons why all of the mountain ranges around the world rose up at the same time. And actually, I discovered a big boo-boo in the Age of the Earth show. I had said... Yet according to mountain experts Allier and Payne, all the mountains around the world rose up at the same time some 55 to 80 million years ago. Oops. <laughs> they actually claimed it was the Pliocene Pleistocene, or 11,700 years ago to 5.3 million years ago. Now within the context of an old earth in deep time, that was yesterday. Now if you are rejecting their conclusions, then I assume you must have an answer for each of their 20 reasons why they said what they did. But that's okay. If you wish to reject their dates, let's use some other ages. We just covered a report in Science Magazine where the authors claimed Grand Canyon was cut to its present elevation approximately 70 million years ago. Let's use that age instead. You also claimed that erosion rates in the past were different than they are today. An excellent argument against uniformitarian ideas, and I couldn't agree more. But wait a minute. While you acknowledged that the rates could be faster in the past, you stuck to the assumptions of slower erosion rates in the past. Good and proper science asks the question, what was the erosion rate in the past? I can provide numerous lines of evidence that erosion rates in the past were millions of times faster than they are today. Water gaps and wind gaps, planation surfaces, quartzite boulders with percussion marks, giant wave ripples, etc geomorphological principles you apparently ignored. 
Grand Canyon had to have been cut in days to weeks. Now, if you miraculously raise the Colorado River up 3,000 feet to crest the uplift, then you have a gigantic lake, which now catastrophically dumps, rapidly cutting the canyon, probably in days to weeks. Pretty simple logic. But nevertheless, I'll oblige your figures. According to Judson and Ritter, actual measured erosion rates were between 1.5 inches and 6.5 inches every 1,000 years. Now let's be as favorable to deep time as possible and go with a figure smaller than their smallest. Let's assume an erosion rate of 0.03 millimeters per year. That works out to about 2,100 meters of erosion in 70 million years of Grand Canyon. That's about 7,000 feet of rocks eroded away in that time. Now, you could say that accounts for the upper layers of the Grand Staircase, which were eroded away. Excellent! Uh, why did it all erode away here and not here? And what about the Colorado River Basin? Is the mighty Colorado River eroding more or less than the rainfall on the land surface? Obviously, more. But if we use our unrealistically small figures in that same 70 million years, you would have eroded the bottom of Grand Canyon to 4,500 feet below sea level. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. The moment you start to invoke millions of years, you produce millions of problems. Now, you also tried to allege rock cycles. You want the continents going up and down with erosion removing rock, then the subduction of the continents putting the rocks, eroded rocks back onto the continents. Well, wait, that doesn't just destroy the ro and recycle the rock, it would also destroy the fossils in the rock. Yet we find both allegedly old and young fossils within those rocks. As you can see, there are numerous insurmountable problems you run into when trying to explain away rapid erosion rates. I'd suggest thorough background reading before making your next comment. There is so much more I want to discuss, but we're out of time. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Thanks for joining me, and I hope you'll join me again next Genesis Week. You can send in your feedback in a number of ways. Remember those words of our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. We'll see you next week. We need your support to help keep this program on the air. You can help by making a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K2P4. You can also sign up for Ian's newsletter, detailing current research and news items at ianjuby.org.